Hello, history buffs. Finally, there is an internet conversation that is right in my wheelhouse. I've seen a lot of discourse lately about statues in the media, on Facebook, on blogs, in articles. Sometimes these ideas are conveyed in a protest chant or a quippy one-liner. Other times they're gonna take an hour-long YouTube video to get across. Now all of these media have their place, but I find that nothing changes hearts and minds like having a difficult conversation with your loved ones. However, if you still find it to be a daunting task to sit down with your loved ones and try to explain why the public veneration of individuals whose worldviews and ideologies deny the humanity of certain community members and how that could maybe lead to a toxic environment, just send them my way. Or better yet, sit down with them, watch this video together, and when you're inspired to have conversation, pause me and talk to each other. I'm a public historian and I really love it when people talk to each other and work through things through dialogue. Speaking of which, hi there! I hear that you're a little bit uneasy about the whole statue situation. Well, this is totally normal. Statues and monuments are beautiful, they're expensive, they inspire awe, and they represent national cohesion and ideology. When we see statues and monuments in public in the cityscape or landscape, they show what the land means to us, it shows that we were here, it shows that we held and upheld our beliefs and ideals. Since we're not truly face to face right now, I don't want to presume too much about what you might be thinking and feeling, but based on previous conversations I've had, I know that a lot of people are feeling kind of unsettled about the whole idea of statues and monuments being taken down. I've known people who are awed by the physical beauty of a cultural space to the point of tears when she realized that it, like everything, is impermanent. I've known people who were angered and who felt threatened by the proposed name change of an institution. He felt that it would erase his history. People like their history to be presented and preserved the way that they were taught it. It gives them a sense of cohesion. And when that gets disrupted by new ideas and new historical interpretation, whoo boy, that's unsettling. The assertions that I hear the most often, and I bring them up here because maybe my viewers will relate to them, are you can't change history and you can't erase history. And what I think people mean to say is that you can't change the past. Now, I'm totally on board with not being able to change the past. I'm not here to change hearts and minds that much. But the thing is, history isn't the past. History is the study of the past using facts and interpretation. History is intended to answer questions like, what happened and why does it matter to us, the people who are alive today? So just like any other discipline, for example, science can change the ideas that we have, the facts and laws of biology will remain constant. So too will history change, but the facts of the past will always have happened. And the fact is, history does change. It changes all the time. You may have had an experience where you hear a historical interpretation that is so different from what you learned in school. You want to scoff, what, are they just making up history now? And that's a very emotionally honest reaction to have. The history we learn and the stories we tell contextualize ourselves and our understanding of the world. They're incredibly powerful and potent and that's why it's so important to get it right. That's why we still have academic historians refining and fixing our historic narratives. So why do narratives change? Sometimes you get new information and you have to change the story in accordance with the new information we have. Sometimes more time goes by and with more time comes more perspective on what happened. Histories are all written by someone for their contemporary someone else's and all of those people are trying to grapple with different issues over time. So depending on who it's written by, you're going to get a different impetus, different perspectives, and different calls to action. And sometimes groups who are traditionally left out of the historic process get to join the conversation for the first time and they bring a whole new perspective with them. And in addition to our cultural conversation shifting around us, our philosophies change too. And in accordance with new philosophies, we get new schools of history. That's why when you read old history books, you learn just as much about the period that's writing about the history as you do about the period of history being written about. 
No history is ever going to be objective because history is a discipline based in interpretation. We're always doing the best we can, but we know it's never gonna be perfect. Now, because history is at least partially responsive to current events and ways of thinking, you're going to have different conversations about history within different time periods in history. For example, you better believe that historians in the 1920s were a-okay with the whole slavery thing when eugenics were all the rage. But by the 1960s, the conversation has changed. You've got black culturalists and black historians really getting a foothold in the conversation, and they have a very different thesis. The study of how history changes over time is called historiography, and it can be a really useful concept to return to when you feel your historical ideas being challenged. You learned what you did about history when that was the conversation being had, but now the conversation has changed for any number of those aforementioned reasons. And this experience of thinking that one thing is relevant to a conversation about history when really the conversation's moved on is not exclusive to people whose last brush with history was in high school any number of years ago. This happens to professional academic historians with PhDs and tenures. You are not alone. Most historical monographs start with a historiography section to get the reader up to speed on what the conversation that they're joining is all about and what they're going to add to that conversation. But sometimes they miss their mark. A great example of a book whose contents are not only irrelevant to the conversation being had but is actually deeply flawed and offensive is Stanley Elkin's book Slavery. This book was originally written in 1959 and was quickly overtaken by the Black Studies and Black Histories of the 1960s. When he republished in 1971, he included an afterword in which he writes, What my critics have written is important and must be taken account of, but I wish to do this with other purposes in mind than simply vindicating slavery. I should like to make certain predictions about the future course of the argument. I am assuming that the present one has taken on a certain repetitiveness and acquired certain locked-in features, that this could in time become dangerously stultrifying, and that the cycle once more can and should be broken. A new object of interest, the phenomenon of ideology, has arisen in other areas of historical study within the past five years. Ideology is a subject that has to be thought about and written about with standards we are only beginning to get used to. It is this phenomenon and this interest, I should guess, that may create new or altered perspectives in the study of slavery. So we can see that the study of history changes, and it can change pretty fast. It took 12 years for Stanley Elkins to start rescinding his thesis because the conversation had moved on. That's not long. But we're not here to talk about the historiography of slavery. We're here to talk about those monuments that you love. I hope that this crash course in historiography has gotten us warmed up to the idea of history changing and the fact that it does all the time, because the scholars actually agree with the protesters on this one. Like I said in the beginning of this video, the thing I care about most is the ability to foster good conversation. And I find it really hard to have good conversation when we don't know what everybody is saying. I want to go through a little bit of historiography about monuments with you for two reasons. One, I think it's important that if we're going to have this conversation, we need to be on the same page. And number two, I want to empower everybody to have this conversation about monuments. And in order to have this conversation, you have to know what's going on in the conversation. So let's get started. So our first article that we're going to look at was written in 1995, so it's 25 years old. It's called Cast in Stone, Monuments, Nationalism, and Geography. Noala Johnson argues that the cultural geography of a space as defined by monuments, statues, and other public iconography are going to shape cultural awareness and attention towards certain people, events, and situations that have happened in the past. On one hand, she argues that the process of nation building is integral to creating a cultural cityscape. This is a way for a people to build an identity for themselves based on ideas, accomplishments, and history. On the other hand, protests about how we define ourselves through public art are nothing new. Surely the people should have some say in how we develop this national identity. Our next article comes from 2007. Certainly recent scholarship around Holocaust and slavery commemoration attests the deeper socio-political and cultural tensions such monuments can continue to evoke. The resurrection of quote-unquote dead statues into living popular memory is dependent then on the specific historical and political context. The late Victorian statue of the merchant Edward Colston, 1636-1721, in Bristol aptly illustrates the point. 
This representation of Colston as a saintly benefactor only began to be challenged in the late 1990s when his slaving connections were publicly revealed. Subsequent vandalization of the statue occasioned a furious public row and revealed deep local divisions about multiculturalism and civic identity. Even dead statues have the power to provoke. It will further be argued that those statues, monuments, and memorials, which do explicitly mention slavery and the slave trade, those honoring abolitionists, generally marginalize the experience of enslaved Africans in favor of a self-congratulatory and nationally defensive political agenda. Next we've got a 2012 article by Lara Larson. During periods of political transition, the removal or destruction of public monuments can portray as potent a symbolic message as the erection of such monuments since the very qualities that make public statues so valuable in building popular support for one regime also makes them a target for destruction when that regime falls. This process is particularly exemplified in former colonies which have achieved independence and statues erected during the colonial era represent symbols of imperial rule. Within these ex-colonies, such symbolic messages are especially expressed in the capital city where the seat of government is located and where political authority is centered. And then lastly, we've got a 2018 excerpt from a juggernaut in the field, Kirk Savage. When standing soldiers kneeling slaves first appeared in the 1990s, the neo-Confederate movement was still in full swing. Confederate statues were being lovingly restored and sometimes even rededicated with new ceremonies. The idea that these monuments had been designed and built to promote white supremacy was often dismissed, but most of the time simply ignored. Today, that idea has become mainstream, discussed in newspapers and websites and talk shows. Now the defenders of Confederate monuments have largely abandoned the ideological fight and retreated to a seemingly neutral defense of quote-unquote history. Like it or not, they say, these monuments represent our history. Removing them, therefore, is an act of historical erasure. If there is one lesson to be learned from studying how monuments get chosen and built, it is that they most certainly do not represent history in any straightforward or responsible way. They represent the agendas, obsessions, prejudices, whims, and occasionally the high ideals and aspirations of the people in society who happen to have the power to erect them in public. The resulting commemorative landscapes are highly politicized and often bizarre assemblages of historical characters, many of which have been long forgotten, sometimes deservedly so. All right, I know that that was a lot, and for some of you, you might feel like I've just knocked you around with the full weight of the Academy, and I promise you that was not my intention. I just need everybody to be on the same page so that we're having the same conversation as defined by both the Academy and the Common Discourse. If we've learned anything from Stanley Elkins, it's that you have to know what conversation you're joining if you're going to take part. So to summarize this conversation, number one, statues which venerate Confederates and the Southern cause are hateful. Number two, hateful statues have no business being in public spaces. Number three, everybody has a right to feel safe and secure while they're in public. Four, Confederates are not the only hateful peoples in our history. Five, the founding fathers weren't that great either. Six, defacing statues is a legitimate form of protest. Seven, this protest actually shows how much history the protesters know. And eight, destroying and defacing statues doesn't erase our history. Now, if you disagree with that, that's totally okay because you don't have to agree with it to respect that this is where people are coming from and this is why we're talking about taking down the statues. You can disagree and still understand. Now, if you've come this far in the video, you might be asking who am I to say boo about monuments, which is a fair question by trade and training. I'm a public historian. Um, public history is a field that is most commonly associated with historic sites and museums. Essentially, what we do is we study history and the way that people engage with history so that we can better communicate history and historical ideas to the public. Generally, this can take the form of special events, tours, exhibits, podcasts, monuments, anything that falls under the realm of history, and the audience is anybody who's interested.
When I'm not in quarantine lockdown, a big part of pretty much every job I've had in the last five years has to do with interpreting cultures. And because of this, I'm actually really good at mining artwork for its historic value. And right there is kind of the catch. A lot of artwork and culture scapes don't make the history that they're based on self-evident. And so my job has been to interpret that history for visitors. Now, that's not a dig at artists. Artists are great. It's just kind of impossible to put all of history into one statue or one abstract monument. It can't be done, and that's not the purpose of public art. It's not to explain all of history. It's to glorify an individual. It's to venerate an idea. So that's me and that's my job, but I'm not really afraid of losing that if all the monuments go away, because whatever replaces it is going to need interpretation too, because that's just the nature of art and history. Because I work in public, I know a lot of people disagree with me. People confide in me their fears and concerns about change, and I listen. I think the best way to have a conversation is to be fully able to articulate what the other person wants to communicate so that we can do more than just talk past each other. So when people tell me they're afraid of losing their culture and their history, I get it. Those are really heavy and complicated feelings to have. So if you feel differently, feel free to articulate that in the comments. I'll listen. In fact, let's take a break and just take a deep dive into some of my favorite monuments because I do have favorite monuments. Number one is more of a category of monuments. I love any memorial markers that get folded into a cityscape. A really good example of this when I was in Tromsø is I kept seeing these little metal plaques on the ground and I didn't recognize at first what they were, but then I learned that these were marking the homes of different Jewish residents who had been kidnapped from their homes and deported during World War II. It's personal, it's specific, it's discreet, and it honors the loss. Number two is the pool where the Twin Towers used to be. I like that it symbolizes reflection and a moment of pause before action. Number three, I actually feel like maybe I'm doing these in reverse order because I think that the Hiroshima Peace National Park is a really cool monument to a site of tremendous destruction. What I like about this memorial is that it has a mission. There's a fire that burns there and will burn there until all the nuclear weapons are destroyed. Number four is the Russian World War II memorial. This memorial takes the form of a giant tank trap, which was one of the most important wartime inventions by the Russians because it stopped the Nazi tanks. And the placing of this monument is where they stopped the Nazi advance. And number five is the original design for the United States World War II memorial, not the one that we actually have. Because I don't have a picture to show you, I'll read out Kirk Savage's description of it. Originally, the architect, Friedrich St. Florian, wanted to tell a story of death and loss, more in tune with the VVM. His winning design in the 1996 design competition, though much larger and more intrusive than the final design, told that side of the story more forcefully. Two huge earthen berms planted with white roses were designed to frame the rainbow pool on the north and south ends. Although these were meant to shelter interior spaces required by the competition program, they had the appearance of a burial mound scooped out in the middle. At the interior edge of each berm was a colonnade of 25 columns, their capitals cut off, a repetition of the broken column motif commonly used for children's graves in 19th century cemeteries. So I have favorites too. I'm not some heartless snowflake or ivory tower goon trying to take your or anybody's heritage. My preferences are totally subjective and up to me, just like your preferences are totally subjective and up to you. I never really thought about my favorite monuments before, but there are some connections here. All but one have to do with World War II, and every single one has to do with collective loss. I really wish that our World War II memorial was more like the one Kirk Savage described, but when it came time to build the memorial, it sparked outrage. In the years after 9-11, we didn't want World War II to be a loss because nationally, we needed a win. But whichever one of these two you prefer, the underpinning conversation is that there's more than one way to remember anything. Memorials are conceptualized by artists, approved by committees, funded by governments, and everyone along the way is going to have opinions about what it should look like and how we should symbolize these things. Monuments don't spring into being as symbols of national cohesion. They're created by people, people with opinions and agendas and money. 
Actually, it might surprise you how recently the National Mall was a literal forest. 1926. It looks the way it looks now for not even a hundred years. The only monument older than a hundred years is the Washington Monument, and the whole side of the National Mall where the Lincoln Memorial sits had to be dredged out of the Potomac River. It might be surprising to learn this because the city of Washington was built to look ancient. Federalist architecture evokes ancient Athens and ancient Rome with a political purpose. This is where democracy and republic were invented. And that's what we're all about. Actually, if you're curious about the evolution of the National Mall, there's a great Washington Post article that you can look through. I'll link that below. Now, I'm going to keep on about the National Mall a little bit longer because one, it's where I live and where I went to school, and so it's the example that I'm most familiar with, but two, it's a very high profile and very central to the conversation that everybody's having right now, and so it's a good jumping off point. However, everything that we talk about having to do with the National Mall and the monuments and the statues there can be extended to any community and any public space. So to further demonstrate the constructed and purposeful nature of a cultural geography, let's look again at Kirk Savage as he describes the transition from the forest and the national lawn of the National Mall to what we have today. Although the Park Commission's mall was a green belt, it actually split the city in two by cutting a huge gash through the urban forest that had come to blanket the capital in the 19th century. The east-west axis of the mall had always threatened to split the northern and southern halves of the city, but when the mall was reforested in the second half of the 19th century, it reunited the city under one great arboreal canopy. As late as 1926, when the mall's forest forest was threatened but hanging on, an article in the Post could still declare, were it possible to make the buildings vanish as if by magic, the groves and gardens would for the most part present a better unity. By clearing a wide corridor through the city's forest, the 20th century mall disrupted that sylvan image of unity and severed the historic connections between the grounds of the mall and the grounds of the rest of the city. So the thing about monuments, or anything that's in public really, is that it's put there with a purpose. It's meant to be seen, it's meant to awe the audience, it's meant to influence, if not outright control, the conversation held in that space. So what do statues and monuments say? Well, they're physically imposing and they cost an awful lot of money. Even just a full-scale statue in bronze or marble will cost you anywhere between a quarter and a half million dollars, and that price just keeps going up if you get bigger and bigger. So if as a community you're sinking that kind of money into this project, you're, you're saying it's a priority. You're saying we stand by this. But monuments are also representative. They represent the people, the ideas, the values that we believe in and live by. But the thing about representation is that it doesn't encompass the whole. With the representation of an idea comes the loss of specificity about that idea. You have to really compress your ideas in order to get them to fit into a statue or monument. And as a consequence, it's really hard to learn history from one. In order to really appreciate the context of a monument, you have to know your history already. So a monument doesn't really teach history, what it does is it glorifies history and it venerates its subjects. So what exactly are we glorifying? Honestly, all sorts of different things. I've shared my list of favorite monuments and they're generally about groups of people overcoming or moving past incredible hardships. But lots of monuments and memorials are for specific individuals and by extension, their accomplishments, their ideas, and their legacies. For example, the Jefferson Memorial represents the man, sure, but it also represents the Declaration of Independence, the birth of this nation, and Enlightenment thinking more generally. This vague sense of origin that we get when we look at the Jefferson Memorial or think about Thomas Jefferson is where monument and historical knowledge end and imagination begins. See, the thing about historic figures is the less that we know about them, the more room we have to imagine them how we want to imagine them. When we really learn about these people, we might not like what we see. And I'm not even talking about the slavery. At least not yet. What I'm talking about is the public backlash to NPR tweeting the Declaration of Independence like they do every year. And this is relevant to Thomas Jefferson because the Declaration of Independence was written by the Committee of Five, of which Thomas Jefferson was the principal author. 
But NPR didn't get backlash because Thomas Jefferson owned people. They got backlash because people didn't like the ideas presented in the Declaration of Independence. Because they presented the Declaration of Independence over Twitter and 140 character sound bites, people would read little bits of it out of context, not realize that it was the Declaration of Independence, and then assumed that NPR was trying to make us revolt against the government. So let's read some tweets. It is the right of a people to alter or abolish it, and to institute a new government. And the replies read, and this isn't cherry-picked, this is just what they said. So, NPR is calling for revolution. Interesting way to condone the violence while trying to sound patriotic. Your implications are clear. Fear, violence, and intimidation to promote a political and racial agenda? Hmm, gee, where have we seen that before? Except this time, government at all levels is codifying this movement as if it's in statute. Wow, at least I know my voice is being heard when people on the left are threatening to burn me and my family alive. The concerning part is that now when the left disagrees, they resort to violence and burning, and that's what's being supported. Oh, so I guess we could go out there, commit acts of violence, since we're minorities? They wouldn't let proof of it be posted right. But the truth is that we all know conservative minorities don't count. They'll keep coming for us and silencing us. This is not about race. So as we can see from the tweets, these aren't all the same person. This is how people react when they read Thomas Jefferson's actual words. They don't seem to like what Thomas Jefferson has to say very much at all. It makes them feel angry, offended, and attacked. So based on all the references to the left and the conservative minority, it looks like the right wing doesn't like Thomas Jefferson very much. At least not the ones who follow NPR Twitter. So the Declaration of Independence is, well... I would say that it's one of the better known pieces of the American canon, except that it seems that a lot of people haven't read it and don't know what it says, so I guess it's fair to assume that this will be most people's first time hearing about Thomas Jefferson's 1789 letter to James Madison. On similar grounds, it may be proved that no society can make a perpetual constitution or even a perpetual law. The earth belongs always to the living generation. They may manage it then, and what proceeds from it, as they please, during their usufruct. They are masters, too, of their own persons, and consequently may govern them as they please. But persons and property make the sum of the objects of government. The Constitution and the laws of their predecessors extinguished them, in their natural course, with those whose will gave them being. This could preserve that being till it ceased to be itself, and no longer. Every constitution, then, and every law naturally expires at the end of 19 years. If it be enforced longer, it is an act of force and not of right. Why 19? Because that was the average length of a generation when Thomas Jefferson wrote that. Anyway, I don't think that many stability-minded centrists would like that sentiment very much. It seems very prone to upheaval, which I guess leaves it to the people on the left to defend Jefferson's legacy and... Well, now we are going to talk about slavery. To say that Thomas Jefferson is a monster who enslaved his own children is an understatement. But this video is not about cataloging every crime against humanity that he ever committed. I don't want to lose you when we've already come this far, but I just want to say there's no exaggeration to the cruelty, abuse, and manipulation that went on at the people living at Monticello. And so it will not be the left who comes to Jefferson's defense. So I don't feel compelled exactly to ask why should we take down the Jefferson Memorial, but more, why should we even keep it up? His beliefs, actions, and words don't seem to jive with anybody alive today, and not even he would think that we should keep it if we don't agree with it. And the thing is, for people who don't know about or can easily overlook the ugly things in history, the Jefferson Memorial is actually a beautiful outside pavilla that really adds to the landscape and the beauty of the National Mall. When you go down to the Tidal Basin during cherry season and you see those beautiful pink flowers and the beautiful rolling green hills and the white pedestal up on the, it's beautiful. It's large, it's aesthetic, it's imposing, and it's inherently endorsed by the United States government, specifically the National Park Service, who maintain it. But for the people who do know their history, it can be literally quite painful to go to the National Mall and see a statue in veneration of somebody who saw you as less than human. 
All right, I've been talking for two hours. If you're still with me, you're a trooper. Let's summarize what we've got so far. Memorials and statues in public spaces are there to venerate individuals and ideas. However, this person or this idea can't possibly be encapsulated in their entirety through a work of art. So if you don't know that much about them, the work of art itself can awe you and capture your imagination. But if the person who's being venerated upheld an ideology that denies you your humanity, you'll probably grow to resent it, especially if it's maintained using tax dollars. So. What's the deal with Confederate statues? Most of the statues we have that commemorate the Confederate States of America or the people who fought for the Confederate States of America were put up in the 1920s and the 1950s, a good long time after the Civil War ended, which means that they don't have any historical value. It's not like we need them as a cultural inheritance. But wait, what about that World War II design I wanted? Well, okay, at least that one had a unique design to it and artistic merit. By contrast, most of the Confederate statues were mass-produced. So there's really nothing special about them in terms of artistic merit either. It's kind of like if you and all of your friends have a bust of your favorite American president above your fireplace, it's not as if you each went out and commissioned your own unique bust. You just went to the store or a museum shop and you bought it there. You didn't each go out and commission your own piece. You got a mass produced object, which means that there isn't a whole lot of artistic value in it, except for what that representation of the president means to you. And if your favorite president is Jefferson Davis, I'm not going to tell you that you can't have a bust of him in your house, but that is the difference between personal opinion and public expression. Now, maybe you want to invoke free speech, and I actually agree with you that the First Amendment is the most important amendment. Now, free speech does have limitations, and some countries have more limitations, some countries have fewer limitations. The United States actually has fewer limitations than a lot of other developed countries. For example, hate speech is free speech here. However, there are still gray areas. If you do hate speech while committing an act of violence to somebody, your crime is now upgraded to a hate crime and the penalties are stricter for those. For another example, we often have barriers to entry depending on who wants to see what. One place where we see this is the movies, and this can range from anything from the straight up haze code to the rating system that we have now. It all depends on what you want to see and if you have children, what's appropriate for them to see. And then third, we also have rules about when the consequences of your speech go beyond having said what you said. For example, texting, you just have to do it like you said, can sound really affirmative and positive. However, this is one of the last few texts that Michelle Carter ever sent to her now deceased boyfriend. Her text, was encouragement for him to commit suicide. Because of the role that she played leading up to his death, she was convicted of manslaughter and went to prison for 15 months. The judge said, this court has found that Carter's actions and failure to act where it was her self-created duty to Roy since she put him in that toxic environment constituted reckless conduct. So there are limits and there have to be limits. So what constitutes toxic? We could go through every example, not in this video because it's already too long, but in the comments below, I would encourage respectful conversation about what constitutes toxic. However, I will say that the public veneration of individuals whose worldviews and philosophies were incompatible with the humanity of people living in the communities today incontrovertibly creates a toxic environment. It's an explicit endorsement of their values and an active threat against your community members today. And if you don't endorse their worldview, surely their comfort and safety comes before your ambivalence. And it's bad enough when private organizations put up hateful statues, but when tax dollars are used to cast and to maintain these statues, that's a whole other level of yikes. And maybe you think I'm stretching when I compare venerating a racist to literally contributing to manslaughter, but I don't think so. Let me explain. Race has laced this conversation thoroughly. So I find it pertinent to take a moment to talk about why racial tensions are more pressing and more violent than ideological ones. It isn't and can't be purely academic because in Hannah Arendt's words, racism, white or black, is fraught with violence by definition because it objects to natural organic facts. A white or black skin, which no persuasion or power could change. 
All one can do when the chips are down is to exterminate their bearers. Racism, as distinguished from race, is not a fact of life, but an ideology. And the deans it leads to are not reflex actions, but deliberate acts based on pseudoscientific theories. Violence in interracial struggle is always murderous, but it is not irrational. It is the logical and rational consequence of racism, by which I do not mean some rather vague prejudices on either side, but an explicit ideological system. Under the pressure of power, prejudices, as distinguished from both interests and ideologies, may yield. That may not have been as clear as I hoped, but what it means in essence is that while you can change your mind, you cannot change your race. What this means practically is that if you disagree with somebody on principle, you can resolve your disagreement through conversation. But if you disagree with somebody's race, you can't fix the problem through conversation because it's not a matter of agreement or disagreement. A real-world practical example of this is while a person of color cannot change their race, a person who venerates racist statues can change their mind and stop doing that publicly. And until we do stop venerating bigots in public, people of color will never feel safe and secure, because the only way for them to fit into the ideologies promoted explicitly by the veneration of these statues is for them to stop existing full stop. This is why statues are coming down and being defaced. They are incompatible with a welcoming public environment. As a way of conclusion, I want to read one more passage from Monument Wars, because I think it's a beautiful idea. And if there's anything we need more of these days, it's hope that things can get better. The proposal begins with a moratorium on new monuments in Washington, lasting at least 10 years. Monuments already authorized and in progress would be allowed to move ahead. During the moratorium period, the mall would host commemorative work of a different kind. Artists, designers, students, civic associations would all be encouraged to create ephemeral monuments temporary installations, interventions, and reinterpretations throughout the landscape. The Capitol has witnessed a few of these already. Christoph Watico's Hirschhorn Project of 1988 is one of the most celebrated. But the possibilities could expand exponentially if wide latitude were granted as to location, format, subject matter, and design. At the end of the moratorium period, an independent body would be assembled to undertake a thorough appraisal of the project with as much outside study and as much widely representative public input as possible. This body would then make a broad-based recommendation, either to continue the moratorium or to propose a new set of principles for the memorial landscape of the future. Shifting the ground from the permanent to the ephemeral would alter the system dramatically. The idea would be to treat the memorial landscape more as an open conversation than a quest for an immutable national essence. The advantages would be numerous. No project could last long enough to become ossified or obsolete. Designers would be much freer to embrace debate and difference without worrying the controversy would defeat the project. Projects could give a much greater weight to the anti-memorial impulse that has been such a deep and enduring theme in American culture. Nicholas's tablet, on which people write what their hearts dictated, would be perfectly in place here. No group, however powerful, could lock up the most valuable memorial real estate. Coalitions and perspectives that are never represented in the memorial landscape would emerge experimentally. More voices would find room for expression, creating a far more open, democratic sphere of memory. Imagining how a landscape would actually look is impossible, but whatever forms it took, it would be a living landscape, diverse and open to change. Obviously, such a program would require many detailed guidelines. Who would be allowed to participate? How would they be funded? What rules would they have to follow? And so on. It would not be difficult to overcome these bureaucratic hurdles were there the will to do so. In the end, though, this is not a decision that schools or planners or artists can make, nor should it be. To take such a dramatic step would require a more widespread shift in thinking, in the sense of what is possible. Already, the sight of millions of people spilling over the National Mall in January 2009 to witness the inauguration of an African-American president suggests how many Americans want to believe that a new possibility has arrived. It remains to be seen whether the country can begin to heal its divisions and face the future with an inner confidence that matches its outer might. 
But it is possible that one day we may come to Washington with new eyes, that we, citizens not only of the United States but of the world, may step outside the limited perspectives of our own group, tried or indeed nation. And if we do that, we may find new cords of memory, to use Lincoln's great phrase, that bind us to each other and create the platforms of symmetry and understanding we so urgently need. That sounds to me like a really beautiful thing. And I would encourage everybody to try and imagine how you can represent this country and its ideals in a new way. And if you care to share, I'd love to hear them in the comments below. And until next time, and I mean this sincerely, make history.